All right, turn your Bibles to John chapter 5. Uh, I was trying to figure out how to begin this passage, so here's how we're going to be- begin. It's quite shocking right at the beginning, so just fasten your seatbelt, put a crash helmet on, you'll be okay. Uh, anxiety disorders are the number one mental health problem in the world right now. Did you know that? And by di- disorder, it means that anxiety has become anxiety has come to a place in your life that is negatively impacting your life, so they call it a disorder. That's why it's called a disorder. It's kind of an an unfortunate term, but that's the way it is. In the United States alone, uh, anxiety disorders impact 40 million adults. That's 18.1% of the population is is experiencing anxiety in a way that's negatively impacting their life. If we go to children between 13 and 18 years of age, it's 21.5% it rises of the population. Then when you get into into 20-somethings, college students, Health officials are saying we're at epidemic levels, off the charts percentages. The percentages are so high they haven't calculated them yet. Universal consensus among mental health professionals is that anxiety and stress go hand in hand. Why does anxiety and stress go hand in hand? Because stress is an outside pressure. Stress is is stressful situations, people, circumstances, your roles, challenges in life. Those stresses are things that come at us. From the outside, why does it impact us? It hits us on the inside. In other words, stress puts pressure on the inner self. Though it's coming from the outside, it hits you on the inside. It puts pressure on yourself. It makes demands on your inner self. It has strong, these these stresses from the outside, people, life events, challenges, your roles and responsibilities in life, hurtful, harmful things that happen to you. They hit you from the outside, and they hit you on the inside. They make strong claims on your inner self. There are powerful obligations that squeeze your inner self. In other words, pressure on the self makes us, well anxious. Universal consensus among mental health professionals is that anxiety and substitute substance abuse go hand in hand. Why? Because substance abuse is an attempt to control anxiety. It's an attempt to deal with it. It's an attempt to at least get some relief and bring it to an end for at least a little amount of time. In other words, substance abuse is a form of self-healing. It's a form of self-medicating. It's a form of trying to control the painful experience of anxiety. Universal consensus among mental health professionals is that anxiety and depression go hand in hand. Why does anxiety and depression go hand in hand? Because anxiety is a painful experience. There's unwanted, intrusive thoughts, feelings, bodily sensations, experiences. Nobody wants it. Now, what if you can't control it and you try to manage it and control it? Eventually, it leads to the inability you can't, and it leads to depression, hopelessness, despair. I can't manage this painful thing. I can't fix this painful thing. I can't control this painful thing. That's why depression comes in, according to mental health experts. We live in an age of anxiety. And so did Jesus. Please stand for the hearing of God's word. Today's reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, an Aramaic called Bethsaida, which, was, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there 
and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said that to you? Take up your bed and walk. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated, y'all. Oh Lord, we ask that you would shine on the page. Would you fill us with your spirit? Would you grant the reality of this passage? So cause us to experience you with this passage. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so on Thursday, I did my textual work for the sermon on the Sunday. I usually do it on uh, Tuesdays. That's my usual routine, but it was spring break, and hey, I wanted to spend some time with the family and go to uh, a place like Legoland with Ty. Um, however, I do not recommend going to Legoland in the middle of spring break. Would you recommend going to? No, we would not. I, I have never had such hard thoughts towards little children in all my life. At the end of that day, on Thursday, I studied this week, this past Thursday, I went to visit Martin, Martin Kemper, many of you know who he is, uh, and I said to Martin when I saw him, look, you have to help me with my sermon this week. I just got done studying the text, still trying to figure it out. Um, Martin uh, and I usually meet on Tuesdays, and what we do is we discuss the sermon that was just preached previously on that Sunday. We would talk about it and go over it, and he loved going over the sermon. So when I walked in on Thursday and said, hey, you got to help me with the sermon, we read the text together, and I said, so Martin, what's the point? What's the big idea? What's this passage all about? And those of you that know Martin uh, know that Martin is laying on his back, and that Martin um, is losing all control of himself uh, inch by painful inch. Uh, he is, has a breathing machine that helps him breathe. Um, he's ravaged by ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. He communicates by a, a computer-generated electronic voice that he uh, activates by using his eyes to look at letters, to form words, to form phrases, to form sentences, to communicate. And so... Martin, what's the point of this text? What's, the, what's this passage all about? And Martin says, it's all about control. Perhaps, perhaps it takes someone who's lost all control to actually get this passage. I don't know. So let's figure it out together, shall we? All right, let's look at verse 2. Now, there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in which Aramaic called Bethesda, which means house of divine mercy. That's what, that's what Bethesda means, which is pretty interesting, which has five roof colonnades. Now, the sheep gate was in the northeast corner of the wall around Jerusalem. Here's what's happening. There are three walls. You heard the walls around Jerusalem. Those are very, very big, important in Nehemiah and all the Bible stories, the walls, the walls being rebuilt. There are actually three walls around Jerusalem, concentric for protection. The innermost wall on the northeast corner that goes in is near the temple. That's where the sheep gate is. This is where animals for sacrifice enter the temple. Uh, this is where there are two pools. 
two of them, north and south, that the animals would come through the gate and clean, get cleaned and cleanse themselves in the pools. Now, these pools are massive pools. Uh, the, the two together, north and south, are 318 feet. 300 feet is a football field. East to west, the width of them are two football fields wide. These are massive pools. This is bigger than the pool at west, certainly bigger than the pool in your backyard. This is a massive pool, and it's enclosed, roofed with five colonnades. So this is an incredible scene of five pillars supporting a massive roof, covering a massive pool. The whole site is incredibly strange. Look at verse 3. In these five roof colonnades lay a multitude of invalids. Invalids defined as blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. What a strange place. Can you imagine? Can you imagine sacrificial animals everywhere and sacrificial people everywhere all mixed up together, bleeding and pleading together, crying out together, in misery together, in helplessness together, in inability together, in incapability together, all of creation, animal and human experiencing very personal, very real incapability. This is a massive place in which no one's in control, from animal to human. What a strange place. What a strange scene. The life expectancy for a male at this time was 40 years. So this man is 38, which means his whole lifespan, he has lived a shattered life. He has been helpless for his whole life. He's been unable his whole life. He has not been in control his whole life life. In verse 7, John calls the one man the sick man. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes I bypass words and I say, ah, maybe not. And I know that's God kind of moving with me, helping me slow down, look at things I need to look at, not run by things that I usually run by. Usually everyone understands what a sick man is. I just decided, well, what does that mean in the original language? Let's just take a look. Here's what it means. It means to experience some kind of personal incapacity, inability, limitation, or weakness. In other words, to be a sick person is to have experientially, personally, in your life, you know in your gut, you feel it deep in your bones, you're limited. You're incapable. You can't fix it. It's an area to be a sick person, according to this text, is to have some area of your life where you personally feel out of control. Incapable, powerless, helpless. And then I went further. I went, okay, now I'm going to look at the major primary lexicon for the Greek language. And I looked it up, and it says it's to be weak, of weakness. And now we're moving into like deeper territory, deeper waters, more profound realities of what this person's experience is. Because you know what that means? To be weak of weakness. He's broken by his brokenness. He's shattered by being shattered. He's sick by being sick. It's a deeper sickness. It's one thing to have cancer. It's another thing for the cancer to crush you. It's one thing to be shattered by the flu. It's another thing to have the flu shatter you. Mental health experts would say things like, it's being depressed about being depressed. It's being anxious about your anxiety. It's being fearful 
about your fear. It's being controlling while you're out of control. It's weak, a weak, a sick man. This, this is a story about control. The deeper sickness. This is why Jesus says to the sick man in verse 6, do you want to be healed? <laughs> of course he does. I mean, who doesn't want to be healed? Everyone wants to be healed of their cancer. Everyone wants to be healed of ALS. Everyone wants to be healed of their physical illnesses. Everyone wants to be healed of their anxiety. Everyone wants to be healed of their depression. Everyone wants to be healed of physical, mental, immediate suffering that we experience in this life. Everyone wants to be healed of any kind of suffering. And that's why the commentators go crazy. The scholars go crazy over this. What is Jesus saying? Of course everybody wants to be healed. What a stupid question. In fact, on, on Thursday when I first studied this text, my first reading of this text, I wrote in the margin. You can see it right here. That's a crazy question. Who doesn't want to be healed? So what is Jesus doing? Jesus is talking about a deeper healing. Jesus is talking about a deeper sickness, the sickness for control that produces all kinds of anxiety in our life. Listen to the deeper sickness for control in the sick man. I mean, listen to it. You hear it in verse 7. He says, do you want to be healed? What's a normal answer? If you were just put yourself in his position, Jesus, you don't know it's Jesus. So let's just pretend that someone comes up to you. I walk up to you and I say, hey, do you want to be healed? You would usually respond sarcastically, right? Most of you, sarcastically. Some of you would be like, heck yes. Others of you, I mean, what would be a normal response? What would be an abnormal response? An abnormal response would be something like, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Do you want to be healed? First, we need to deal with the stirring of the waters, right? Let's get by that real quick, then we'll tackle what he's actually saying. Uh, the belief in that day was that an angel of the Lord would descend, this is the belief, would descend from heaven and walk through the waters, thus the stirring of the waters. The first person in, after the stirring of the angel in the waters, was healed. So the question is, good night. Was that happening? <laughs> I don't know. But I do know enough people were healed to create this kind of a scene. And I'm going to shock you further. I'm going to tell you something that's going to shock you because that's why I'm telling it to you because I want it to shock you. Calvin believed it to be true. Which should blow your minds about what you know about Calvin. He said, oh, of course an angel of the Lord walked in the waters and stirred the waters. God was still at work through his temple at that time. And he would show up periodically like that. All right, let's get back to the sick man, right? And what the sick man says. Listen to his deeper sickness. Notice that he hears in Jesus' question, what does he hear? An accusation. Do you hear what he's saying? You can hear him. He hears in Jesus' question like, dude, you're not doing enough. Dude, you're not working enough. Dude, why haven't you fixed it? Do you want to be healed? That's how he hears it. The man is anxious about himself. Listen to it again. The sick man answered, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. He's got excuses. He's trying to defend himself. I, I, I'm trying. When the water is stirred up, I have no one to put me in the pool. And then, and then while I'm trying to get in there, someone always beats me to it. They get healed. Why does he hear Jesus this way? Why is he so anxious about himself? Answer, because he interprets life. 
He sees life. He interprets life. He hears what Jesus is saying. He lives life out of this deep sickness for control. Have I done enough? I'm not doing enough. I need to try harder. I need to fix it. I need to control it. I need to work it. I need to perform it. I need to do it. I need to do it. I need to do it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not enough. I am enough. I'm enough here. I'm not enough there. They like me. They don't. Thomas Gardner, who wrote John and the Company of Poets, remember that's that $85 book I bought two weeks ago. He says it this way. He offers an excuse, having understood the question as an implied accusation along the lines of, have you really tried? To which he essentially replies, you don't know how hard I've tried. Jerk. But Jesus is not making an accusation. He's not interested in the man's excuses. He's interested in making the man whole, end quote. This is why Jesus simply heals him. Jesus says, do you want to be healed? He hears it the certain way. I'm trying, I'm trying, dude. I'm doing the best I can. And Jesus goes, I'm not interested in your trying. Be healed. Get up. Take your mat and walk. Jesus simply heals him. Jesus is not interested in your anxious control. He's not interested in your anxious performance. He's not interested in your anxious working. He's interested in healing you of it. We need to be healed of the deeper sickness of control. We need to be healed of the deeper sickness in our being for control. This is why Jesus' question seems so ridiculous. Do you want to be healed? Everyone wants to be healed of their immediate suffering, but Jesus is not talking about the immediate suffering. He's pointing to a much deeper healing. Do you want to be healed? He's bringing in a category that's not even in his category. He's he's putting forward the opportunity And the possibility of a healing he knows nothing of. Do you want to be healed? We need to be healed of the deeper sickness for control in our life. This is why the story continues after the physical healing in verse 9. I mean, do you see that? The story continues that this was just about the physical healing. If it was just about the immediate healing, the immediate removal of anxiety, the immediate removal of depression, the immediate removal of a physical illness or disease, the immediate removal of a bad marriage, the immediate removal of, 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 it would have ended there. But it continues, and the text is actually moving to verse 9. Now, that day was the Sabbath. Oh, my word, y'all. That day was the day of not working. That day was the day of rest. That day was the day of resting in someone else's work, not your own, the work of God is what the Sabbath was all about. And it's on this day that Jesus seeks to heal, to bring someone to rest, to bring someone into the Sabbath, to bring someone into cosmic healing. It's so fascinating. You study all the the four Gospels. Do you know that Jesus does not go seek out people to heal? People seek him out to be healed. The only time he seeks people out to be healed in all four Gospels is on the Sabbath. I am your Sabbath. 
I am your rest. I'm the ultimate Sabbath. We need to be healed of the deeper sickness for control. This is why there's conflict between the religious leaders and Jesus. Do you see it? Over the Sabbath, over the fourth commandment, there are two different ways of approaching the Sabbath, two different ways of living in life. Everything is converged. The whole universe is converged. The animals are watching. The crickets are chirping. Everybody's watching. This is the first conflict with Jesus in John. This is a massive conflict. It sets the stage for the paradigm of all conflicts in the world of all times and all histories and all peoples, and it all comes down to this. Do you work for rest? The religious leaders, every major belief system in the world, every religion, do you work for rest? Or do you rest in the work of another? Those are the only two ways to live. Religion says you work for rest. You work for healing before God, before others, before your career, before your health, before your blessings, before your relationships, before your suffering. You work for rest. And Christianity says, no, you rest in the work of another. Jesus is saying, I'm the deeper healing. I'm the one that brings the deeper healing. I'm the Sabbath. I'm always working. Do you see how it ends? God is always working. I'm always working. I worked for you so you can rest. I work presently for you so you can rest. I will work continuously for all eternity for you so you can rest. Do you trust in your working or do you trust in my working? That's the cataclysmic conflict of this passage and the world right there. We need to be healed of the deeper sickness for control. This is why Jesus finds the former sick man for a second time. If it was all about his immediate healing, he would have left him. But no, Jesus, it says, found him. So again, he's finding him. Second time he's finding him. And it's fascinating that he finds him in the temple. People are all up and, well, they're all debating about whether he became a Christian or not. And that's not the point of the text. The point of the text is the healing. But it's interesting that Jesus finds him in the temple. And everybody says, well, he's a tattletale. He tells on Jesus. Well, notice they were asking for who told, you not to, who told you to carry your pallet. But when he actually goes and talks to them, he tells them about the one that healed him. His emphasis was on healing, not on the walking or the disobeying of the fourth commandment or breaking the Sabbath. So anyhow, in verse 14, he finds him a second time, and Jesus says to him, and has an exclamation mark, see, you're well. Dude, high five, you're great, Right? And then it just shifts slightly. Sin no more. Strange. Sin no more so that nothing worse may happen to you. The nothing worse we're going to find next week when he keeps talking in John 5. But here's what's happening is that this text is actually giving us the nature of sin. It's actually telling us what sin ultimately is according to John and according to the book of John. Sin is the deeper sickness. We need to be healed from that. And the deeper sickness, the nature of sin in this text, is trying to work for your rest, trying to earn your rest, trying to merit your rest, trying to perform for your rest, trying to control anxiously your life. Instead of trusting in the work, the rest of another. The nature of sin at its heart, we think to think is about some behavioral thing, and Scotty mentioned something we do. It's something we're in, and the nature of it is we work 
for rest. We anxiously toil to get a Sabbath, a healing. This is why John Scholar, the $85 book guy, says, they, the sick man and the religious leaders, are part of the same world. A world of requirements, of rules, of obligations not to be ignored. The man, the sick man, has been crushed by that world. He can't do it. But the religious leaders have been elevated by that world. They think they can. But they both live in the same world. In other words, we live in a world of control. That's the world we live in. We live in a an age of anxiety. That's the world we live in. We're all anxiously working for rest. That's why we're anxious. Trying to make sure we're okay in our person, trying to make sure we're okay in our performance, trying to make sure we're okay in this area, constantly. You know, one of the major emphasis in the Old Testament is this verse called in the Psalms, cease striving and know that I am God. It's a fantastic passage because what it's basically saying, cease striving, is a military word. It's lay down your arms. So the picture is absolutely breathtaking. What the psalmist is saying, in the midst of the arrows flying, the spears thrusting, swords slashing, shields banging, body on body, the text is saying in the midst of the world, in the midst of all the hell that's breaking loose, in the midst of the fighting, in the midst of it all, lay your arms down. Lay down your weapon and know that I am your weapon. I do the work. Not you. Put your sword down. Cease. Cease striving. And know that I am the Lord. We need to be healed of the deeper sickness for control. Look at verse 7. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there already a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Here's the point. Right now, Jesus sees you lying there in all your anxious control. Jesus not only sees you, but he knows you down to the depths of your misery right now. Do you want to be healed? Rise up. And that's a very fascinating word because it's the same word, the better translation. Jesus says to him, get up. It literally means rise up. It's the same word. John uses at the resurrection. Rise up. Rise up. Rise up with him. Take your mat, the mat that you've been laying on, the mat that has crushed you, the mat that has trampled on you. You carry it now. And walk. I worked for your rest, I work for your rest, I will work for your rest. The text ends with Jesus saying, I'm always working. Rise up in his work. Rise up in his rest. Rise up and walk.